Hello everyone. Hope you're all safe and well wherever you may be. My name is James Hibbs. I'm based in Jersey and I'm the head of Melville Douglas Diversified International. Today I'm going to be talking about our responsible portfolio offering and the investment case for investing responsibly. I will also be joined by David Jardine, one of our colleagues from Stanlib, who we partner with for third party fund selection and research. And David will touch on the manager selection process for the offering. To start with, a bit of background on some of the types of investments and acronyms you may have heard of or be familiar with. On this slide, what we have called the investment continuum ranges from traditional financial only investing with little or no regards to ESG practices, no real restrictions and a focus simply on generating competitive returns in any market across to philanthropy, where precedence is given to the non-financial aspects of investments. Ethical portfolios were designed to be run in line with the predefined moral viewpoints often religiously based and usually managed with a range of hard exclusions, such as no guns or tobacco or alcohol. SRI or socially responsible investing was the first set of environmentally and socially aware funds, but again, largely based on negative screening or on an exclusionary basis and quite often willing to accept lower absolute and relative returns in order to achieve wider societal good. This did lead to the formation of some constrained benchmarks such as the uh, FTSE for good indices, which are still used today, but very much based on negative screening. ESG or environmental, social and governance, something that you're probably all familiar with and are hearing a lot about, very prevalent today and becoming the norm for most investment managers. So we view ESG as a risk control framework aimed at pricing in non-financial risks. ESG does not necessarily exclude any industry or company, but it simply seeks to ensure that an investor is adequately compensated for any risk being taken. The vast majority of investors with an ESG policy still concentrate on the G, the governance aspect, rather than the E and the S, which are much harder to quantify. However, I would say there is definitely regu regulation coming, particularly driven by the EU, to try and create a framework and way of measuring all aspects of ESG, which should definitely help investors and is something that David will touch on later. And then we move into the sustainable and impact area, where our responsible portfolios have been designed to sit. Following more progressive ESG practices, and here it is really about intentionality, looking to have a positive impact on society or the environment, rather than just screening out the companies that do harm. Importantly, also still looking to enhance and generate competitive returns. One of the biggest drivers for responsible investing is definitely now climate change. Environmental issues are now very much part of the mainstream, part of government policy and investor thinking, and with very good reason. This was a popular cartoon with our managers last year, and it really tries to give a sense of the scale of the challenge that we face with climate change. As one manager noted, air pollution kills more than 7 million people every year, more than double what COVID-19 has so far. And the issue is definitely taking on ever greater significance with governments and countries around the world. The Paris Agreement was the first legally binding international treaty on climate change. Adopted by 196 countries in 2015, it aimed to limit global warming to well below 2 degrees and targeting 1.5 degrees. For the first time, really, this brought all nations into a common cause to undertake ambitious efforts to combat climate change and adapt to its effects, but also importantly, providing enhanced support to assist developing countries to do the same. After former US President Trump famously removed America from the Paris Agreement, the US is very much now backing with Biden. It has its very own climate czar in John Kerry and a very strong environmental agenda, which was recently highlighted with a new goal to cut emissions in half by 2030. China's goal of achieving carbon neutrality by 2060 suggests green development will be a core growth driver over the next decade. China is the powerhouse of the global economy, soon to be the largest economy, that will have a huge impact on global progress and on investment. The EU has really been a driver in this space and their Green Deal was a plan to make their economy more sustainable, to boost efficient use of resources by moving to a clean circular economy, restoring biodiversity and cutting pollution. Their aim is to be climate neutral by 2050 and cut emissions by 50% by the end of the decade. And this was all re-emphasized as part of their pandemic response and one trillion euro budget. Next on the agenda is COP26, the latest UN climate change conference, hosted by the UK and postponed from last year. And there are two high ambition goals for the conference. The first is for countries to make net zero pledges, but importantly backed by credible plans. 
And the second is to establish the tools and markets so that every financial decision can take climate into account. There's no doubt that the speed at which climate-related developments are occurring across policy, technology, and consumer trends is accelerating, and it has to. The latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change actually provides that 2035 needs to be the target for global net zero emissions, rather than 2050, which was laid out in the Paris Agreement. Most major governments have proposed or submitted stronger targets since Paris, and we would expect this to continue with greater urgency and greater investment to work towards meeting the 1.5 degree temperature scenario. And importantly, us as individuals, one of the biggest impacts we can have on climate change is how we allocate our capital. Another key development for responsible investing has been the UN Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. These were adopted by all United Nations member states in 2015 as a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. As well as issues addressing the environment, they also look to the global challenges we face, such as poverty, inequality, peace, and justice. The 17 goals shown here are all interconnected, and the aim is to achieve them all by 2030. Very ambitious goals that will require significant action and capital investment. So it definitely isn't just about the climate. The World Economic Forum, an independent group of business, political and academic leaders, probably most famous for their Davos get together, they produce a global risk report every year. And in 2021, unsurprisingly, four of the top five risks were environmental, with the other being infectious diseases. But risk number six and seven both related to digital inequality and the need to address that specific issue. This is directly aligned to SDGs 9, 10 and 11, and one of the themes we invest in within our portfolios via a responsible infrastructure fund. And the SDGs have also provided a framework for investors. A lot of the managers in the impact or sustainable investing space align their investments to a specific SDG and assess their non-financial performance relative to one of these goals. In order to provide a real sense of the level of investment required, I've highlighted here on this slide some of the figures that have been suggested which are huge by any measure. Taking the $90 trillion that the G20 have suggested is required to achieve sustainable development and climate objectives, this is more than the total GDP of the G20 in 2019. But there is a wall of money required from governments and corporations, and no surprise that we've seen increasing demand from investors. Goldman Sachs estimates that in 2020, to the end of October, ESG type funds received 120 billion net inflows globally, whilst broad equity funds actually experience net outflows of over $125 billion. In addition, intergenerational wealth transfer to the next generation will be the largest in history, estimated to be over $64 trillion over the next 20 years, with an ever-increasing focus on societal stakeholders and responsible capitalism. Surveys show that the majority of millennial and Generation X investors want social responsibility in their investments an issue that trustees are going to have to grapple with, the likelihood being that a trustee's fiduciary duty to the next generation of beneficiaries will include non-financialist aspects such as sustainability and environmental impact. Pension legislation is already moving that way, with an amendment to the pension scheme bill in the UK potentially forcing pension schemes to align their investment strategies with the Paris Agreement. And this is something we're likely to see more and more of and another huge potential windfall for sustainable or responsible investing. Our responsible portfolios now have a three-year track record. They're something we've been working on for some time before that. The investment case is now undeniable, and the investment universe is getting larger all the time. The range of managers and funds on offer now allows us to implement our usual processes and create multi-asset discretionary portfolios within a responsible and sustainable investment framework. There's also increasing confirmation of the correlation between a com company's environmental and social performance and their financial returns. A report from one of our managers shows there's a great deal of evidence that simply having diversity in decision making at both board and management level is positively correlated with better financial performance, with the investment returns of companies that score well in diversity outperforming those that score less well. Our managers really see investing in the space as a competitive advantage. They will benchmark themselves, as we do, to unconstrained benchmarks and against unconstrained peer groups, while still aiming to deliver superior investment returns. As shown here, we have three real basic aims for our responsible portfolios. 
Importantly, they must reflect our proven investment philosophy and process. Asset allocation is aligned to our wider business, as is the manager's selection process. The solution is very much ingrained within Melville Douglas Diversified. As one would expect, we aim to promote environmental and societal good. But what is key is that we can now do this without sacrificing investment performance. We're investment managers, we're aiming to enhance our clients' wealth and to outperform our benchmark and peers. But equally important is that we can do this whilst taking the same level of risk as for an equivalent unconstrained portfolio. We believe there's a huge structural tailwind for investors in responsible strategies. And I'll now hand over to David, who will outline how we select managers who aim to take advantage of that. Thanks, James. At Stanlev Multi-Manager, we have a well-established and proven manager selection process, which we have refined over more than 20 years of multi-manager investing. The first point is that we primarily focus on the qualitative aspects of manager selection. As such, we spend most of our time meeting the managers to gain a deep understanding of their investment philosophy, process and company culture. We believe this is the key to understanding the true worth of an investment process and helps us to identify great managers with genuine, repeatable investing skills. We aim to avoid strategies chasing short-term fads or running excessive risks that may not be highlighted by quantitative analysis alone. Our approach is particularly well suited to responsible investing, as we must assess the non-financial as well as investment aims of the strategy. Over the years, we have met with many managers in this space, which has allowed us to establish our own peer groups to allow meaningful comparison between appropriate managers. We then move to the quantitative analysis, where we study historic performance and portfolio exposures to validate what we already understand from the investment strategy, and of course, to ensure that long-term performance is competitive. Finally, we monitor and review managers on a regular and ongoing basis. Over time, this helps us to build up a thorough understanding of the nuances of each manager. It often takes several years before we are finally comfortable to invest in a fund. The key consideration for responsible manager selection is the non-financial aspect of the investment process. Here, we are looking to understand and clearly define those goals, whether they might be environmental factors such as decarbonisation, waste reduction or water preservation, or social responsibility factors such as diversity or health and well-being. And we need to know how the manager defines success or failure to these targets, as well as how we, as investors, can hold them accountable to these goals. The better managers in this area provide regular reporting to keep investors updated on the non-financial aspects of performance, as well as the investment returns. We believe the quality of these reports is a key factor to consider when selecting managers in this space. We also try to establish that the culture of the firm is highly aligned to ESG best practice in all areas, and that responsible investing is embedded in the DNA of the company. This helps to ensure that we avoid so-called greenwashing, where exuberant marketing and asset gathering are prioritised over genuine ESG considerations. We saw earlier the bewildering range of ESG and SRI investment categories. Within those, the Melville Douglas Responsible Portfolios primarily invest in sustainable and impact strategies. We are beginning to see regulation to help investors understand what these terms mean, and the recent EU Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation helps us to define what you should expect from sustainable and impact investments. For both of these categories, we would look for best practice integration of ESG analysis at the heart of the investment process, as well as exclusions from certain industries such as thermal coal, controversial weapons or tobacco. Sustainable investments should have both financial and sustainability objectives, with a values-based approach for sustainable outcomes. We would expect to see a clear linkage from the investment process applied to each underlying investment to sustainability themes. With impact strategies, we would expect a greater focus on the non-financial objectives of the portfolio, with clear, 
measurable goals to be reported alongside the financial performance. The focus will generally be on companies generating impact and positive transformation towards these specific objectives. Having followed this approach, we have selected a blend of core sustainable investment funds along with some thematic impact funds, which we believe offer a best-in-class exposure to a wide range of responsible investment objectives, whilst at the same time offering an attractive long-term investment proposition to grow our clients' wealth. I'll hand back to James now to talk you through some of the current themes. Thank you, David. This next slide highlights the current themes that our portfolios have exposure to, namely renewable energy and responsible infrastructure, alongside some of those we are considering for future inclusion. It also shows the UN SDGs that these themes are aligned to, and against which the non-financial impact of the funds selected will be assessed. As with everything within our portfolios, the important thing is maintaining diversification and blending these themes to ensure risks are balanced. So the end result of our work provides our clients with exposure to a broad range of asset classes and some of the world's leading managers, all contained in client portfolios that are fully aligned to each client's individual risk profile, investment objectives, and long-term financial goals. And this is all done within the Melville Douglas Diversified Investment Philosophy and Framework. So, we believe investing sustainably is not only good for the planet and society, but can also provide a competitive advantage. And the results so far certainly back that up. As I mentioned earlier, our portfolios reached a three-year track record at the end of last year. And the figures shown here detail our model portfolio performance, net of all fees, versus both unconstrained benchmarks and peer groups. These numbers include the first quarter of this year, which was certainly a less favorable environment for this space, given the market was driven by traditional energy and financials. And finally, to summarize, the investment case for responsible investing is undeniable. There's a significant structural tailwind to investing sustainably, and we and our managers see investing in this space as a competitive advantage. Our multi-manager portfolios within Melville Douglas, diversified, aim to have a positive impact on society and the environment whilst minimizing harm. And finally, and importantly, we can do this whilst also generating competitive returns for our clients and without taking additional risk. Many thanks for listening to this whistle-stop tour through the investment case for investing responsibly and our own Melville Douglas Diversified Responsible Offering. Please contact your usual wealth or relationship manager or one of the teams shown here should you have any questions or would like further information. Thank you.